Live from Boston, my name is Emilio Madrigal, and today is March 30th, 2021, and welcome to this edition of PathCast. We're delighted today to welcome Dr. Raymond Redline, who's a professor of pathology and reproductive biology at Case Western uh, University School of Medicine, and he will be delivering a talk on uh, OB pathology titled Placental Architecture, Maturity, Vascular Pattern, and Dysmorphic Features. As always, please feel free to post questions and comments in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we'll make sure to pass those along to Dr. Redline at the end of the session. So with that short introduction, we'll pass the microphone over to Dr. Redline. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're going to talk about a topic that isn't often covered in placenta. Usually lectures are on vascular disorders and inflammatory disorders. Today we're going to more address the development and abnormal development of the placenta and how to recognize that in your everyday practice. So in order to understand abnormal development, of course, we have to have some idea of what the normal development of the, the placenta is. And we're going to be focusing um, today on the fetal stromal vascular compartment. So the villus trees uh, of the placenta. Um, and this diagram taken from Banershka's textbook in 2006 is uh, somewhat instructive. Um, we, we often look at second trimester and early third trimester placentas, especially from uh, preterm births in the nursery. And the normal villus architecture um, at that stage is really composed of immature um, intermediate villi, and then what are called mesenchymal villi that sprout off these immature intermediate villi. And both of these are characterized by a very loose connective tissue with a lot of histiocytes, some stellate fibroblasts, um, and some centrally uh, placed capillaries. Um, but the trophoblast is rather thick at this point, um, and the capillaries are not closely opposed to the trophoblast layer. Um, as you move into the late third trimester, you get the development of what are called the terminal villi, and that's really the functional um, unit of the placenta that allows for fetal growth to really explode over that period of time. The villi get much more uh, mature. The, the intermediate villi are now called mature intermediate villi. They have much um, more uh, conventional um, uh, connective tissue, fewer histiocytes, and the terminal villi bud off these uh, mature intermediate villi. And they're basically just capillaries with a thin layer of trophoblast to decrease that diffusion distance to maximize gas exchange. Um, the regulation of this um, growth um, is uh, regulated by both the mother and the baby. Um, the mother um, regulates the growth by the amount of blood that gets into the placenta, the spiral artery perfusion. Um, the tension, uh, the oxygen tension of that blood that gets into the placenta. Um, so hypoxemia plays a role, and especially in vascular proliferation, um, and the nutrient supply. So excessive amounts of nutrients like glucose in a diabetic can cause um, changes in maturation. Also regulated on the fetal side um, by the umbilical perfusion of the placenta, um, the amount of growth factor that's produced in the placenta and that gets to the placenta from the fetus. Largely, this is insulin, which is also um, regulated by maternal glucose. And um, then, of course, as, as in all of development, the genetic background of, of, the, of the fetus, uh, both the maternal and paternal characteristics. So I just want to quickly run through what villi look like at different stages of pregnancy to put um, the, the abnormalities in context layer later. So at low power in the second trimester, sort of pre-viability age, um, you see that the um, immature intermediate stem villi um, have that loose connective tissue appearance that I uh, described earlier. Um, the distal villi just look like smaller versions of the larger villi. So it's just a, a matter of changing in scale but you don't have a whole lot of connective tissue in the villi at this stage. And you can see that the villi are rather central, the stroma is somewhat edematous, um, the trophoblast is thick, it has a, it, it, you can sometimes see a double layer, like up here, where you can see the cytotrophoblast stem cells, but the syncytial trophoblast nuclei are numerous. So they're almost a continuous row um, uh, around the villus, and the overall thickness of the trophoblastic layer is pretty, pretty um, great. And everything is just sort of a, a succession of, uh, of, uh, of less uh, 
immature villi as you move toward term. This would be more your typical preterm placenta in the viable range, starting at 24 weeks, um, ending at 32 weeks. And you're beginning to get a little bit more connective tissue in the, um, the stem villi and the immature intermediate villi. And the, the, the capillaries are moving a little bit closer to the trophoblast. Trophoblast is still thick. There's still a lot of edematous stroma there. So it doesn't look like a term placenta at this point. And then you move into what we call slightly immature. Um, and this would be the late preterm stage, sort of uh, just before term. Um, often you see it in uh, placentas that are de uh, delivered after preterm premature rupture of membranes in the latter stages of pregnancy. These are usually normal um, uh, placentas that just happen to have had membrane rupture, so they get delivered early. And you see that the trend continuing. There's more connective tissue in the sort of larger proximal villi, and the smaller villi are beginning to lose that thick trophoblast, and the, the, the capillaries are beginning to move to the periphery, but you can still see many um, sort of small villi that have central capillaries as well. Um, the main thing is that you don't see capillaries. You still see connective tissue in the most distal parts of the villus tree. And then finally, we move to the um, normal term placental pattern um, after 37 weeks. Um, here you have a definite uh, dichotomy between the mature intermediate villi and the terminal villi. This would be a mature intermediate villus here, more of a, a denser connective tissue, fewer histiocytes. Even in the intermediate villi, the capillaries are closer to the trophoblast. And when you get actually get to the gas exchanging villi, you can see there's many fewer syncytial trophoblast nuclei. You have very thin areas of trophoblast um, and the capillaries are right against that trophoblast where they can pick up oxygen from the intervillous space. So just going in a little bit higher um, uh, power, this is the specialized structure that defines a terminal villus, and that's the vasculosyncytial membranes. And vasculosyncytial membranes are just thinning areas of syncytial trophoblast where the basement membrane of the syncytial trophoblast fuses with the basement membrane of the endothelial cells, um, allowing gas exchange to really just go across a single layer. There are a few stromal fibroblasts and macrophages, but in general, it's really just capillaries up against um, a layer of trophoblast. The trophoblast is thin and the number of nuclei is decreased compared to the slightly uh, immature uh, villus pattern. So in order to recognize abnormalities, um, it's, it's, I, we find it useful to categorize the maturity level of the placenta independently of the gestational age for every placenta that we look at. And our first diagnosis is either immature placenta, slightly immature placenta, or mature placenta. Our second uh, diagnosis would be to relate the weight of the placenta to the gestational age. So that would, our first line diagnosis gives maturity, weight, and whether that weight is abnormal for gestational age. So in normal placentas, those less than 32 weeks would be described as immature. Those 32 to 37 weeks would be slightly immature, and those um, greater than 37 weeks um, would be mature. Um, we do, um, if there are abnormalities, if we see um, a maturity rate that's more than one step different from what we expect at that gestational age range, we will then modify um, by, by saying histologically mature. If a placenta has a histologically mature pattern at less than 32 weeks, and conversely, if at greater than 37 weeks, it looks immature, still has immature intermediate villi and more of a mesenchymal villus appearance, we'll call it histologically immature. Um, if you want to read more about this, um, I wrote a review of this um, topic in 2012, and there's a um, recent um, article that's online now, a review article on uh, placentas in modern pathology, and that's the DOI number. So why do we care about maturity? Well, it's these histologically mature and histologically immature um, placentas that can cause adverse outcomes. So first talking about a histologically mature placenta at 
um, a, a preterm stage. Um, you can get IUFDs with marked fetal growth restriction, um, uh, almost a starvation looking appearance to the stillborn fetus. And the placenta has very small villi um, with syncytial knots, not a lot of connective tissue, and, and an, actually an overall decrease in the number of villi, which I'll, I'll get to and explain in a few minutes. But so this would be an example of pathologic accelerated maturation leading to stillbirth in a preterm infant. <clears throat> The converse would be a poorly controlled diabetic who has a stillbirth um, at term. Um, often these stillborns are um, uh, almost obese essentially um, uh, prior to birth. They have a lot of um, extra adipose tissue, skeletal muscle. And this is all because of the abnormal glucose regulation. So maternal glucose is elevated. It crosses over into the fetus. Insulin is produced by the pancreas. Insulin is a growth factor. It causes the placenta and the baby to continue to grow. And it also prevents villi from becoming mature. So usually growing structures tend to be much more immature than differentiated structures, um, which achieve their final state of maturity. And you can see here that even though the, this placenta is term, has a, a lot of connective tissue, a lot of edema, a lot of macrophages and fibroblasts in the stroma. The trophoblast is thicker than usual at term, and the, the capillaries tend to be um, more central. So putting these in the context of the vascular lesions, we'll talk about lesions that are more um, controlled um, by the maternal vascular supply uh, through the spiral arteries. And um, both for both um, maternal and fetal vascular lesions, they can be subdivided into maldevelopment, malperfusion, and loss of integrity where the, the vessels are somehow um, interrupted uh, between the placenta and either the mother or the fetus. So it turns out that when we're talking about accelerated villus maturation, it's not really a primary maldevelopmental problem, although we'll talk about those sort of primary events that lead to accelerated, val uh, um, accelerated villus maturation. It's really a matter of perfusion. So the perfusion in the intervillous space is abnormal. This leads to a decrease in the normal maturation and growth of the villus tree. So accelerated villus maturation um, is the more common lesion. And then when it's very, very severe, leading to stillbirth and abnormal pulse flow dopplers and things like that, um, we call it distal villus hypoplasia. So starting back in this developmental um, uh, phase of maternal vascular develop, uh, uh, lesions, um, when we look in the first trimester, if we're lucky, we'll see in the spiral arteries, the um, extra villus trophoblast actually forms plugs, which prevents blood from getting into the intervillous space until about 10 weeks of gestation. And this is to protect the fetus against high pressure flow and also high oxygen levels, which are deleterious to normal development. Um, but sometime um, around 10 to uh, 10 weeks, so maybe a little earlier, that trophoblast begins to invade the vessel wall, the spiral artery wall, and remodels it. So the spiral artery loses its smooth muscle coat, the vessel dilates, and the wall is replaced by fibrinoid matrix, which is secreted by these extra villus trophoblasts, which were initially in the lumen of the vessel, but now are within the wall of the vessel. And if this doesn't occur, then you get the accelerated villus maturation that's associated with clinical conditions like preeclampsia or uh, idiopathic uh, intrauterine growth restriction. So it's not always uniform. So this is the normal situation where you would have dilated spiral arteries letting blood flow freely into the intervillous space. In abnormal pregnancies like preeclampsia, um, some of the vessels are normally remodeled, but others are not. And so there's uneven perfusion of the intervillous space. Histologically, you can sometimes see this in the placenta. The spiral arteries in the basal plate in a normal placenta um, don't show any smooth muscle. They have fibrinoid in the wall and they have trophoblastic cells in the wall. But in these um, defective, with defective spiral artery modification, you can see that there is smooth muscle. 
um, lining these two arteries. There's also a lot of loose decidua here. So this often is a consequence of superficial implantation. So it's, it's, it's not that the plugs have formed and then don't invade the wall. It's just that the trophoblast has never really invaded deeply into the uterus. So superficial um, or shallow implantation is sort of the, um, the lowest common denominator of abnormalities in, in preeclampsia and other maternal vascular lesions. So um, Burton um, at Cambridge actually um, published an influential review in 2009 where um, with some physiologists there, they figured out that it's not really letting more blood into the intervillous space that's important. It's decreasing the speed at which blood goes into the intervillous space, so the velocity. And they posit that actually the remodeling of the spiral arteries, its main function is to slow the blood down. It allows a, a normal amount of blood to get in, but the blood is slowed. Therefore, it has time to like perfuse the villi. The villi have time to take up oxygen before the blood goes out through the, the venous drainage in, in the basal plate. In these abnormal pregnancies, without the um, flanging effect of the remodeling, the blood goes in at very high speed, probably in reduced amounts as well, but it goes in and out very quickly. Um, and it uh, really almost bypasses many of these villi, so you don't get the normal gas exchange. And that's actually the reason that it used to be called maternal vascular underperfusion, and then we changed it to, to malperfusion, because it's not purely a, a function of the amount of blood, but also how it flows through the intervillous space. I just wanted to briefly review some gross placental findings that, um, uh, that are, we see with maternal vascular malperfusion and, and accelerated villus maturation. Um, these don't make the diagnosis, but if you don't have abnormalities in some of these things, you should really look at your villi again and really determine, are these do these really show accelerated villus maturation? Because usually with maternal vascular malperfusion, the baby's gonna be small. It wouldn't necessarily be less than the 10th percentile, but it's usually going to be less than the 50th percentile, unless there are other factors like diabetes or obese, maternal obesity. The placental weight is going to be even smaller. So the fetus will be small, the placenta will be even smaller, and that will lead to an increase in the fetal placental weight ratio. So that's actually sometimes more reliable than either of these weights in itself. It's just the fact that the compared with the placenta, the fetus is less affected. The placentas can be abnormally shaped. They're often longer than they are wide. They can be variable in thickness. Some areas can be thin, some thick. Um, they tend to move around in the uterus. So there's more commonly a peripheral umbilical cord insertion, less than three centimeters from the margin. And because of the overall volume depletion of not enough fluid getting into the intervillous space, um, uh, the, 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 the babies tend to be a little bit fluid depleted and therefore their umbilical cord diameters decrease as well. Umbilical cord is mostly just extracellular fluid. So a thin umbilical cord tells you that the uh, extracellular fluid is decreased. Uh, in the fetus. So um, biologically, what is happening with accelerated villus maturation? Well, it's a set of histologic changes that are due to oxidative stress um, induced um, senescence in the villus trophoblast. Um, and so this is a, a function of decreased oxygen delivery, decreased perfusion. Um, and so there's, there's damage to the trophoblast. The DNA is damaged. This causes a cell cycle arrest and something called the senescence associated secretory phenotype. So this is all pretty basic biology, but the important thing is that those trophoblasts then begin to secrete things that are important. So in preeclampsia and idiopathic fetal growth restriction and other conditions where you've accelerated villus maturation, you have an increase in circulating fetal DNA, and that's in the form of exosomes, and often there are uh, micro RNAs that can regulate maternal physiology um, in those exosomes as well. Um, but even more importantly, the trophoblast secretes uh, anti-endothelial proteins. Um, this one called SFLIT is the one that's uh, best known. It's a soluble form of the vascular endothelial growth receptor. And what it does is it sops up all of the va vascular endothelial growth factor, and this causes diffuse endothelial damage in the mother, leading to renal damage, edema, 
uh, seizures and elevated liver enzymes. So all of the sort of uh, diagnostic features of preeclampsia are due to these anti-endothelial proteins that are secreted by um, trophoblasts that's damaged due to um, oxidative stress and accelerated villus maturation. So another thing that oxidative stress does is that this would be your typical immature villus with, an, you know, with a, a, a uniform row of syncytial trophoblast nuclei, central capillaries and everything. Um, when the trophoblast um, undergoes oxidative stress, it balls up and it collects at one end of the villus. And this is what we call syncytial knots. Now, a few syncytial knots are normal in a term placenta, certainly not in a preterm placenta like this one. Um, the teleologically, some have thought that maybe these knots form to sort of stretch the trophoblast so that you can get better gas exchange, but probably it's more just a, a reflection of increased turnover. So um, how many syncytial knots you see is basically a function of their rate of formation um, relative to their rate of deportation. So these syncytial knots break off, they go into the pulmonary vasculature, and then they're renewed. So when you're making knots, more, more quickly than you're getting rid of them, they accumulate on the villi. And so um, the rate of formation increases with accelerated villus maturation and um, they, they're deported usually at a normal rate, although these large syncytial uh, knots can sometimes break off. And so they may add the rate of deportation may actually be increased as well. So increased syncytial knots is an important component of accelerated villus maturation, but it's not the only component. So this is um, just going through it in words, and then I'll show you some pictures. The definition of accelerated villus maturation is not increased syncytial nodding. It's actually alternating areas of villus crowding and paucity of villi. And within the crowded areas, which are often adjacent to the stem villi, you'll see large, dense syncytial knots, like I showed you in the last slide. Also, um, because of decreased overall flow and abnormal flow in the intervillous space, you'll get a fibrin deposition in some areas. And because the, uh, the, the syncytial knots are damaged, the villi will begin to stick together. So you get villus agglutination, two or three villi sticking together. Um, if you have a major hypoxic event, you'll get an infarct, which is just agglutination of hundreds and hundreds of villi, just to, to, to sort of put it in context. Um, and then turning to the um, areas of paucity, you see more intervillous space and not very many villi. So you have very thin villi with decreased branching. So in a way, accelerated villus maturation is a very low power diagnosis. And it, usually you'll have a small placenta, you'll look at your slide tray, and you can tell from just looking at the tray, the, the, the alternating areas of crowding and paucity, that, oh, this is probably gonna be a case of accelerated villus maturation. And the associations of the ones we talked about earlier, it's a small placenta, um, decreased fetal placenta or increased fetal placental weight ratio. And the clinical associations are hypertension, usually preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, and abnormal decidual vessels, which we're not going to talk about today. And the complications are insufficient maternal oxygen and nutrient delivery, leading to fetal growth restriction. And sometimes the placenta has oxi enough oxidative stress that will actually trigger um, the patient to go into um, preterm labor um, or or the preeclampsia in the mother is severe enough that you have to actually electively deliver pre prematurely. And so you have all the, the attendant complications of prematurity. So this is what I meant by just looking at the slide on the slide tray. You can see that a lot of this area, which would normally be filled with villi, is just empty. It's um, areas of villus paucity. And then you have these sort of nodular areas, alternating areas, where you have crowding and increased knots and so forth. Little bit higher power, you can again see um, uh, the paucity in this region um, and then the crowding in this region. Now this is a term placenta. It's a, it's a mistake to think that you can only make that, even though it, it, you're talking about how can you have accelerated villus maturation in a term placenta? Well, we kind of use the term accelerated to contrast it with delayed and make it a simpler for um, uh, people who don't look at placentas every day to think about. So um, it, you can make a diagnosis of accelerated villus maturation in a term placenta. These villi are even more mature. They have more of the characteristics 
characteristics of maturity than you would see in a typical term placenta. So just keep this picture in mind of areas of paucity, areas of crowding, but more than just crowding, there's, the villi are stuck together. There's some fibrin in there. There's more knots than you would expect to see, real cluster knots, then paucity again, and then crowding. A little bit higher power, you can see how the villi are stuck together. There's fibrin here. We're near one of the uh, mature intermediate villi there. There are uh, lots and lots of knots that are uh, densely um, uh, sort of clustered there. Um, but it's not everywhere. You, you have to look at, for these tiny little foci. Um, and then um, in the areas of paucity, you see there's just not many terminal villi. You see a lot of mature intermediate villi here but not that many terminal villi. And the villi are even smaller than normal term villi should be. I mean, they're, they're really just a single capillary in many of these, so the really tiny terminal villi in paucity. Just some uh, a, a variety of pictures to give you an overall sense of what I'm talking about. This would be an area of paucity. You can see the mature intermediate villi, smaller uh, villi, a lot of empty space there. It's another uh, area with increased incisional knotting, a little bit of fibrin around the mature intermediate villi. Um, here we have a glutination where the villi are kind of stuck together. And here we have an exaggeration of the fibrin. So no one of these by itself is diagnostic, but they're always seen together in the areas of crowding. Now, distal villus hypoplasia, you can think of as just being the end stage of accelerated villus maturation. The placenta doesn't grow because it you know, hasn't gotten enough nutrients. So you don't get the crowded areas. All you have is a paucity. So in a practical sense, when the paucity of villi, when the areas of paucity in, in the intervillous space, the lower part of the intervillous space near the basal plate exceeds 30% of the total volume, we call it distal villus hypoplasia. And it's the same thing you see um, in, the, in the areas of paucity with accelerated villus maturation, long thin villi with decreased branching. You may see some sensation knots and villus agglutination, but the villi are generally not crowded. In these cases, the fetus and the placenta are generally very small, less than the third percentile for gestational age. There's a markedly increased uh, fetal placental weight ratio. And importantly, unlike um, the, the more mild cases, you often will get absent or reversed umbilical Doppler flow in the umbilical cord, and that will end in fetal demise if the, if the baby's not delivered. And the reason for the reverse flow is, is that there's just decreased placental vascular bed. Because of the decrease in villus growth and the paucity, um, there just aren't enough capillaries in the placenta to support the amount of blood that's being sent through the, uh, through the umbilical cord. So it kind of just hits a wall and bounces back during diastole. And the complications are just, again, an exaggeration of what we talked about before, severe reduced uptake of nutrients, sometimes leading to fetal osteopenia. And as I said, increased placental vascular resistance causing the reversed uh, Doppler, Doppler flow in the umbilical cord. And this is uh, typical images, mostly space, um, mostly uh, mature intermediate villi, very few distal villi. Um, and um, this picture occupying more than 30% of the basal villus trees the, the, down near the basal plate. Just some additional little lower power images to give you a feeling for what this looks like. Now, sometimes you'll have a placenta, um, maybe the baby's slightly small or there's a, a history of maternal hypertension. You don't see the areas of paucity, but you do think subjectively that there's more syncytial knots and clustering of syncytial knots. So what do you do with a case like that? We don't want to call every placenta accelerated villus maturation. So we use the non non-specific descriptive diagnosis, focally increased syncytial knots. There's no real threshold for this or definition of it. It's more qualitative and descriptive, but I think it, it is reproducible and, and, and probably useful to the clinicians. This is more common when you in a term preeclamptics that are not severe preeclampsia. 
maybe women with some chronic hypertension, some borderline fetal growth restriction. Importantly, once you have hypertension and preeclampsia, even if the villus pattern looks relatively normal, you're still going to release, have, this is still gonna be associated with the release of these ischemia related mediators into the maternal circulation that are gonna cause maternal vascular complications. So what does this look like? Um, this may look normal to you, but um, to me, there's little areas here where there are clustering of syncytial knots and the villi are sort of stuck together. Obviously, you wouldn't make this diagnosis just on one field, but when you look at all the slides, it just it looks like there's more knots than there should be. And then other areas where it looks completely normal in between. This is, this is what I would call focally increased syncytial knots. So now we're gonna turn around and we're gonna look at um, the fetal stroma and um, we're gonna look at delayed villus maturation and then some other dysmorphic or developmental lesions that are kind of related to, late, to delayed villus maturation. And so these are primary maldevelopment. Um, they're sometimes mimicked by malperfusion and we'll talk about how this can mimic some of these changes, but in general, they're not related to the perfusion of the villi. And certainly not, and, and, and even loss of integrity. So sometimes edema can, can mimic delayed loss maturation. So the other categories can sometimes mimic it, but they're not true maldevelopment. So delayed villus maturation is the, the lesion we've already talked about a little bit. Villus dismaturity is a com combination of delayed and accelerated villus maturation in the same placenta. Then we have placentas where there are too many vessels, the so-called chorangiosis and its uh, related lesions. And then we have funny looking villi. We talk about funny looking kids that have facial abnormalities and congenital malformations. Same thing is true of the villi. When the villi look markedly dysmorphic, you can suggest there are chromosomal abnormalities. And in some cases, there's a specific picture um, we call mesenchymal dysplasia um, that um, correlates with a couple of specific um, chromosomal abnormalities. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the second half of the talk here. So definition of delayed villus maturation. I think you can pretty much guess what this is gonna be. It's gonna be enlarged villi decreased intervillus space, and this is gonna to have to affect more than 30% of those villi in the bottom half of the placenta. Um, the stroma in the distal villi um, is gonna have more fibroblasts, more Hofbauer cells, and more pericytes or cell, you know, cells that are sort of surrounding the capillaries, fibroblast-like cells. The capillaries are central within the stroma rather than right up against the trophoblast. And there's a decrease in the number of those vasculosyncytial membranes where the endothelial basement membrane fuses with the syncytial trophoblast basement membrane. Um, there tends to be a thickened trophoblast layer with an increased number of trophoblastic nuclei, similar to those immature second trimester placenta slides I showed you before. The placenta is large. Um, and it's large relative to the fetus. So even though the fetus may be big, the placenta is even larger. Um, diabetes is the most common association with increased fetal insulin acting as a growth factor, especially for the placenta. Um, but sometimes women with obesity or excessive pregnancy weight gain can also have large placentas with delayed villus maturation. So you would think a larger placenta, you know, that's better for the fetus. Fetus is growing fine. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that there are a couple of things. First, the placenta is so big that it itself becomes a, a, a sort of a sponge for, uh, for nutrients. So the placenta is growing, but it's not increasing in function. It's actually decreasing in function because the diffusion distance between the capillaries and the intervillous space is increasing. So you're getting a large inefficient placenta that's taking a percentage of the nutrient and oxygen supply. This decreases the placental reserve to withstand stress. So these are placentas that are working at their maximum capacity. And if there's a sudden decrease in uh, perfusion in the intervillous space, the placenta can fail and you can get a stillbirth. And this is one of the reasons at least why poorly controlled diabetics are at increased risk for stillbirth at term. But this can also occasionally happen in normally grown or even small fetuses. We don't understand why, but sometimes the villi simply don't mature. It may be a developmental issue, it may have to be genetic, it may be epigenetic. Um, it's poorly understood, but the pattern is, is somewhat similar to that you know, that you see in diabetics. So what does it look like? 
So I think this may be from the same placenta that I showed you early with the stillbirth. You can see that um, there's sort of, this is one of the stem villi, and then you have like a decrease in the intervillous space in these large cellular villi that are kind of all crowded together. Looks like a first, uh, looks like a second trimester placenta. Um, this would be the normal term appearance where you have well delineated mature um, intermediate villi and much smaller distal villi. These, believe it or not, are taken at the same power. Or photomicrographs. A little bit higher uh, magnification. Uh, once again, you see the normal pattern with the capillaries up against the, um, the trophoblast. Um, not that many nuclei in the trophoblast. Um, not that much edema, not really loose connective tissue. Here you see very cellular trophoblast, central capillaries, lots of stromal cells. Now again, it's not going to be every villus. You are going to see some areas that look like this, but when more than 30% of the villi look like this, then we can make a diagnosis of delayed villus maturation. Um, just some other images to get used to what it looks like. Uh, here, the stem villi are kind of fat looking, and, and these villi, you'd have to go on higher power, which is here, to actually see the abnormality. Um, this is this is probably the most subtle of the pictures. There's just more cellularity in this in, in these villi, but you see the increase in the number of trophoblast nuclei. You see more central capillaries, and this is a, a more marked uh, example. So the second lesion is um, one that's probably under, underutilized, and we've underutilized it too. We're just beginning to make this diagnosis more often. It's not uncommon to have diabetic mothers who also have hypertension or superimposed preeclampsia. So they may have a combination of maternal malperfusion and delayed villus maturation. And this manifests as seeing sort of large villi that are cellular, but also an increase in syncytial nodding. Um, these two processes can balance each other out so that you think everything is normal. The placenta and the infant have the normal, uh, are in the normal weight range, but their placentas are not put together right. And so they probably do have a decrease uh, in reserve. They're more at risk for stillbirth. Plus, because of the syncytial knots, they're releasing these mediators into the maternal circulation, which cause maternal complications as well. So this would be an example of a placenta with villus dismaturity. Um, this is a term placenta. These villi are really too big, too cellular, central capillaries. And they do have an increase in the number of trophoblast nuclei, but unlike the, the typical delayed villus maturation, there also are many syncytial knots and the villi show some agglutination as well. So this, uh, we usually call this villus dismaturity. And since that's not familiar, we'll either modify that by saying, alternating areas of delayed and accelerated villus maturation or delayed villus maturation with focally increased syncytial knots, just to explain to the clinician what we mean by villus dismaturity. So the differential diagnosis of delayed villus maturation um, um, includes four entities, um, delayed villus maturation-like pattern which you can see with fetal vascular malperfusion due to chronic umbilical cord obstruction. So you'll find papers in the literature that say that delayed villus maturation is associated. One of the things you can see with fetal vascular malperfusion. What I believe in is, is that this is just a function of the obstruction of the venous drainage of the placenta. When you have umbilical cord obstruction, usually it's the vein that gets collapsed. And so there's just more fluid that's collecting in the placenta. This expands the villus stroma. So it looks like there's more stroma, but really it's sort of a combination of edema and just sort of a chronic uh, decrease in venous drainage. Um, and that being said, any kind of high drops, immune high drops or non-immune high drops that causes edema um, the, for all of the many reasons um, that, that high drops occurs and often fetal anemia. Um, so edema can also mimic delayed villus maturation. Um, sometimes you see a patchy non-specific villus edema. It, it's real, it's, it, it differentiates the placenta from other placentas, but like focally increased incisional knots, it's fairly nonspecific. And then there's a specific lesion that you'll occasionally see in the placenta and that you might really wonder what is this lesion, and that, that's called neovillagenesis, and I'll show you that as well. So this would be delayed villus maturation-like pattern. You can see that the stroma is increased. 
the capillaries are dilated consistent with blood not getting out of the placenta. But you can see that at the corners here, these villi look underperfused and they have like some calcification and some dusty nuclear debris. This is what we call villostromal vascular cariorexis. It's one of the hallmarks of fetal vascular malperfusion. Here's another case of fetal vascular malperfusion. These villi look big and somewhat immature, but you can see there are small foci of avascular villi that are interspersed. This is another um, one of the hallmarks of fetal vascular malperfusion. At a little bit higher power, these villi look immature, but again, there's the, the, the focally avascular villi. Now, obviously you could have del true delayed villus maturation in a diabetic and fetal vascular malperfusion, but if you have an umbilical cord lesion like hypercoiling or a knot or a history of a cord around the neck, and you see these um, small avascular villi or villus stromal vascular cariorexis, and you see other lesions in the larger vessels, you have to make a judgment whether you're dealing with two lesions or it's just a delayed villus maturation like pattern. Um, this is edema due to high drops. Um, in, in high drops, it's very common for the trophoblast layer to become detached from the stroma, sometimes helpful in making the diagnosis. Um, the, 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 the stroma tends to be more cellular than uh, in uh, delayed villus maturation. You have more proliferation of fibroblasts and a lot of macrophages. Um, and here we have some villus edema, more of the nonspecific variety, not high drops, um, but in a case of fetal vascular malperfusion. And here we see a couple of villi that show villus stromal vascular cariorexis, and the villi around them show more, um, uh, more um, stromal edema, increased cellularity, and they're a little bit bigger. But as you move away from this focus, the other villi look more normal. So this is more edema mimicking delayed villus maturation focally. Um, this is what I mean by patchy nonspecific villus edema. So in a placenta where all, most of the villi look normal, you'll see small areas where there's an increase in, 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 in uh, edema. Um, this may or may not be associated with adverse outcomes. There are some papers that say that it is. I think the criteria are, are, are really not there and the sort of controlled studies haven't been done. So it's more of a descriptive term. If you see it, you can have a third or fourth diagnosis in your diagnostic line that says patchy nonspecific villus edema, um, but it's unclear what exactly the implications of the lesion are. And then finally, this is the lesion that I said, you'll occasionally see if you look enough at enough placentas, you'll see a completely normal villus tree. And then all of a sudden there are these big edematous villi that look very immature with lots of stromal edema, not very many capillaries. These are areas of new villus growth. So um, they're, they're sort of like you know, placentomes, like a, uh, just, just a very small areas. They're kind of nuclei for the placental expansion. So um, we don't completely understand them. They're like hematogones in a way, in a way um, but just to recognize them and not to, to think there's something that's uh, chromosomally abnormal or dysmorphic about these placentas. Now, just briefly cover the fetal uh, villus capillary lesions. There are three of them, um, chorangioma, villus chorangiosis, and then a, an uncommon lesion that people are not as familiar with um, called multifocal chorangiomatosis. It's actually almost as common as chorangioma. Villus chorangiosis, or an increase in the capillaries in the distal villi is the most common. Five to 10% of term placentas show it. You could, it's really just an adaptation to decreased oxygen delivery. So it's the attempt on the part of the placenta to adapt to a decreased oxygen supply. Um, this is a tumor a vascular tumor within the placenta. And this is another reaction pattern um, to decreased oxygenation. So chorangiomas, um, they tend to be underneath the, the chorionic plate or at the margins of placentas. They are vascular tumors arising in large stem villi. They're uh, most common uh, in near term uh, or uh, late preterm uh, placentas. 
Twins and preeclamptics are much more likely to have them. Um, and when they're small, they usually don't cause any complications, but when they're big like this, they can obstruct blood supply, um, leading uh, to fetal growth restriction. They can sequester platelets within these small capillaries, uh, anastomosis capillaries, um, or sometimes you can get an AV shunt within um, the core angioma and you can get high drops on the basis of high, high output congestive high heart failure. Choriangiosis is a completely different lesion, despite the fact that it, it sounds like it's the same. Um, you have to be careful because the, if you have areas of congestion, you actually have to count the capillaries. So this would be a, a more or less borderline case. You have to have more than 10 capillaries um, per villus cross section. There should be, that should be true in 10 or more adjacent villi. And you should see this in several different areas of the placenta. I don't make a diagnosis personally unless I see some foci that have at least 15 to 20 capillaries because sometimes congestion can mimic this. You don't want to overcall it. This is, this is the villus uh, in, in this particular section that has more like 15 or 20. Um, but again, I, I don't consider this a marked example, just a sort of typical example. The pathophysiology is it's adaptive angiogenesis due to maternal hypoxemia and sometimes hyperglycemia. So in addition to delayed villus maturation, insulin is also a vascular growth factor. So sometimes you'll see both delayed villus maturation and um, uh, choreangiosis uh, in the same diabetic placenta. But more commonly, it's maternal hypoxemia. It's typical of placentas that are delivered from women who are pregnant at high altitudes. Um, smokers have an increased rate. Areas of excessive air pollution, especially in the developing world, there are papers showing an increase in, uh, in choreangiosis, maternal anemia, decreased oxygen delivery to the placenta, and as I mentioned, diabetes. And then finally, this less common lesion known as multifocal choreangiomatosis, you can think of it as choreangiosis, but it's affecting the intermediate and stem villi. So the distal villi may or may not show choreangiosis, but you have also an increase in proliferation of the capillaries in these larger, more fibrous villi. The pattern is a little bit like a choreangioma, but there's no tumor. So it's just at the periphery of the stem villi that you see the vascular proliferation. Um, it's um, also thought to be an adaptive response, but more uh, to more long-standing and severe maternal hypoxemia. And there may also be a component of reduced fetal blood flow that plays a role in this vascular proliferation as well. And uh, so now I just wanna talk about abnormal placental contour, dysmorphic villi, and how it relates to genetic and chromosomal malformation. So as I said before, dysmorphic villi are just sort of like the, the, the placental equivalent of what uh, dysmorphologists called FLK, funny looking kid, funny looking villi. Um, the, they have an abnormal pattern and the pattern is abnormal in terms of the shape of the villus, the branching of the villus, the vascularization of the villus, and also you can see trophoblast inclusions within the stroma of the, of, of the villi. Um, these are much more common, as I'll show you, in aneuploid fetuses um, or in placentas that have an abnormal karyotype, even though the fetus is normal. Um, they can be seen in some cases of idiopathic intrauterine growth restriction um, and in some fetal overgrowth disorders like Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Um, they are often associated with abnormal outcomes, stillbirths, growth restriction, preterm birth, fetal anomalies. Um, they usually are not recurrent because most uh, aneuploidy is uh, you know, sort of a stochastic event, a random event. It doesn't tend to occur unless there are parental uh, cr tr chromosomal translocation carriers, but this is not a common association. Just um, to, uh, these were, dysmorphic villi were originally defined in first trimester um, miscarriages. This was a study that we did back in the 90s where we looked at um, a, a large number of consecutive abortions, all of which were karyotyped here at Case Western. And just looking at a subgroup here um, where we, these were males, so we knew that we didn't have maternal contamination. We looked at 318 with a normal karyotype, 350 with an abnormal karyotype. In the normal group, there was an increase in chronic inflammatory lesions, which we won't talk about today. Um, but this is the, the point I want to make is that some, but not all, 
have dysmorphic features. So it's much more than you would see with the normal karyotype. So when you see it, it's relatively specific, but it's not particularly sensitive. And that 80% of uh, fetuses with an abnormal karyotype, you can't recognize the abnormal villi. So this is what I mean. This is an extreme example. Th these villi are very irregularly shaped. Um, they have lots and lots of trophoblast inclusions in the stroma. Um, there's other abnormalities, these tiny little villi, the large stem villi, but um, the two main ones in, in these images are the irregular contour, sometimes described as the coast of Norway, fjord-like in pouchings, coast of England, um, and in these trophoblast inclusions. Um, and uh, the predictive value of the positive when you have a really striking picture like this is 90% in first trimester um, gestation. So it's a useful finding, um, and especially if there hasn't been a karyotype done and the, then the clinician is not suspecting aneuploidy. This is a partial mole, which is uh, the, the um, uh, triploid, um, which is the, always has dysmorphic villi. It's part of the definition. Here you see the molar villus. Here you see the more normal villi, but there are trophoblast inclusions. And then there's an irregular contour with the fjord-like in pouchings. But you can also see this with trisomy 13, trisomy 18, other uh, trisomies as well. Um, this is a particular pattern that you see in Turner syndrome. Um, and what's abnormal here is you have what are called syncytial trophoblast sprouts. So these kind of micropapillary projections into the interval of space are uh, relatively specific for, for Turner syndrome. And you can see them in uh, Turner syndrome and deliveries uh, in the late second and early third trimester as well. Once you get past those more obvious things, it gets a little subjective and you have to have looked at a lot of placentas. So this is a case of idiopathic fetal growth restriction, um, dysmorphic villi due to their irregular contour, the increased uh, fjord-like in pouchings, and trophoblast inclusions, in addition to some edema and some other nonspecific factors, but mostly the irregular contour and the trophoblast inclusions. Um, this is a case with markedly enlarged stem villi, tiny little distal villi, increased syncytial knots, but also abnormal contour and some trophoblast inclusions. This is an example where the, really the main abnormality is the stem villus edema, but there are some inclusions as well, some funny looking inclusions here, sort of a little bit of an abnormal vascular pattern, but not really a good example of that. The more distal villi look relatively normal, but the stem villi are really more, they're not what you expect at this gestation. So just having stem villi that are out of proportion to the distal villi is one definition of dysmorphic villi. Here's, um, we have, um, what's really a distal villus hypoplasia, but instead of the villi being small and, and like they are in distal villus hypoplasia, they show delayed villus maturation. So this is actually a term placenta in a baby with unexplained fetal growth restriction. There's a decreased branching of the distal villus tree. The villi that are there are delayed in their villus maturation and there are, decrease, there, there are very prominent stem villi and they're, more, they're greater in number compared to the distal villi than you would expect in a term placenta. Here's a similar picture, lots of stem villi with uh, muscularized vessels, and then just a, a decreased number of uh, distal villi. So this is probably the most difficult of the ones I've shown you to recognize as dysmorphic. Um, so these are real, and many times they are associated with adverse outcomes and sometimes documented chromosomal abnormality, but they're not always easy, and you have to have looked at a lot of placentas to begin to, to accurately diagnose them. So it's best not to call it unless you're really sure, and um, it's worth showing to a colleague if, if you have a, have, have a question. Um, also, dysmorphic villi can show abnormal vascularization. So we talked about choryngiosis, choryngioma. These vascular anomalies are harder to, to classify. Here we have a stem villus with lots and lots of, 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 uh, of arterioles, way too many. 
for, uh, for normal. And also you have a proliferation of capillaries in the distal villi, um, both choreangiosis and probably some choreangiomatosis here too. So vessels are abnormal at every level, stem villi, immature intermediate villi, and distal villi. This is a case of Beck with Wiedemann syndrome. It, this is choreangiomatosis. You can see the vascular proliferation around the muscularized vessels. This is choreangiosis, but more than normal, just a really large stem uh, you know, distal villi with way more capillaries than you would usually see in choreangiosis. Um, so this um, is Beck with Wiedemann syndrome, which is an epigenetic disorder involving imprinting, imprinting abnormalities. And then the last uh, lesion that I just want to talk about, I just had a case yesterday that I got in consultation. They're not that uh, unusual. If you see enough placenta, sooner or later, you're going to see a case of this. It overlaps with um, molar gestation because the, the villi have central caverns. They're really large, um, but they don't have any trophoblast proliferation. But occasionally, um, mesenchymal dysplasia can coexist with the mole because as uh, I'll explain in a minute, the underlying etiology overlaps with that of complete hydatidiform mole. So first the definition, um, abnormal stem villi with cystic dilatation, stromal overgrowth, and abnormalities affecting fetal vessels of all sizes without trophoblast hyperplasia. Um, first, and clinically at eight weeks when you begin to see by ultrasound subchorionic cysts, and usually the clinical diagnosis is some kind of a molar pregnancy. Um, there are two types. Um, the less common one is associated with Beck with Wiedemann syndrome, the one that I showed you with the vascular proliferation in the previous slide. Some of them can have um, uh, uh, cystic dilatation of the villi as well. Uh, but more commonly, it's something that we call androgenic biparental mosaicism kyberism, so ABMC for short. And this like complete hydatidiform mole means that some of the placental cells only have nuclei that are derived, only have chromosomes that are derived from the father. They've lost their maternal chromosomes. But unlike a complete mole, where this is true right from the, out, on, uh, the beginning of development, this occurs later. So you have two populations. You have normal cells in the placenta that have a paternal and a maternal um, complement of chromosomes. And then the stromal cells have two copies of the paternal, but the trophoblasts are normal. So the trophoblast is normal, so you don't see trophoblast hyperplasia. The stromal cells are abnormal, so you do see the cystic dilatation that you see with moles. And, um, Complications, in addition to just general adverse outcomes, um, are tumors in the fetus um, or in the neonate. Uh, with Beck with Wiedemann syndrome, that's associated with Wilms tumor and adrenal carcinoma. And in some cases of ABMC, you have some of the same kind of chimerism in fetal tissues. And there's a tumor called mesenchymal hamartoma of the liver, which has been shown to arise from the same mechanism. This is what it looks like. This is a term placenta with mesenchymal dysplasia or ABMC in this case. Um, there are areas that are completely normal and then there are all these cysts. So you might think, well, maybe it's a partial mole. And if it was dysmorphic and looked like a chromosomal abnormality, that, that, that would be a possibility. But partial moles rare, rarely make it to term. So as you can see from the villi here, these are mature, normal villi. And then you have these enlarged villi, some of which are cystic, some of which have vascular anomalies, but none of which show any trophoblast hyperplasia. At low power, um, they tend to cluster and they tend to be in, 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 the, in the stem villi. Um, it, it, some of them, there's more stromal overgrowth. Sometimes there's more edema and cavitation. Sometimes there's more vascular proliferation. It can be different in different areas of the placenta. And just like complete mole, you can use your P57 immunohistochemistry to make this diagnosis. So um, in a case of ABMC, the stromal cells are completely paternal in origin, so they don't express the P57 antigen, but the trophoblast is normal, so it does express the P57 antigen. In a complete mole, the trophoblast would be proliferative, and both the stromal cells and the trophoblast would lack um, P57 positivity. So that's um, all I have to say, and I'd be uh, glad to entertain any questions you might have.
Thank you so much, Dr. Redline, for this excellent talk. Uh, I have a few questions online from the viewers, so I will read them out to you. So the first question is, uh, this is regarding distal villus hypoplasia. And the question is, uh, how can you be sure that these are not cut artifacts? Yeah, so it's important to get full thickness sections that fill up the entire slide. And the way that we do that, when we gross placentas, we'll take little blocks of the placenta and fix them and form one for a few hours. And then we'll come back and, 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 and take our sections so that we get well-oriented sections that include the chorionic plate, the basal plate, and a good area. They're basically two by two centimeter blocks of tissue on each slide. So yes, I, I think that um, in, in placentas where um, you get little slivers of tissue and they're not well-oriented, it can be difficult. Um, you, hopefully you'll be getting, so we recommend getting five sections from each placenta, three uh, sections that are from the stroma. And so hopefully if you have a sectioning artifact in one of those three, that you would be able to look at the other two and see how generalized the findings are. Thank you. The next question is, is there a correlation between a previous viral infection such as COVID-19 and placental vascular thrombosis. Yeah, so this is a controversial topic. Um, as, as usually happens, like with Zika virus or any new infection, um, there's a rush by all the placental pathologists to look at placentas and publish something. What are the typical features? And so um, there was an early paper that said fetal vascular malperfusion was increased and an early paper that said maternal vascular malperfusion was increased. I've looked at about 160 COVID placentas now, and, and also th this is borne out by others in the literature. I don't think there's any specific lead in 99% of COVID patients. But there is a very dramatic lesion in the, in, the, in maybe 1% is even high. But occasionally COVID mothers can get a full-blown uh, intervillicitis and fibrin deposition where almost the entire intervillous space is obliterated by necrotic placental tissue, fibrin, and inflammation. Um, so that's my experience with COVID. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, are the presence of areas of villous agglutination and increased syncytial nodes physiological after the 37th week of gestation? When are they pathological even at term? Right. So I think one problem with placentas is there's a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot of fibrin. There's a lot of areas that look a little bit different and you really have to get an idea of what normal is. So once you cement that area, you know, that, that, that view you have of a normal placenta, then you be can begin to see um, placentas that have too much aggl agglutination, um, too many syncytial knots. And um, usually the term placenta, you might see in an occasional focus of agglutination you won't see paucity. Knots will be pretty evenly distributed. If you think they're slightly increased, you can call them focally increased. But in a term placenta, you can certainly make the diagnosis of fetal vascular malperfusion. The placenta is usually small. There's often a history of preeclampsia. And there's that zonation with the paucity alternating with the areas of crowding. And within the crowding, agglutination is only one of the findings. So you really should see some fibrin, some agglutination, and some knots all in pretty much the same area. So you can, you can make a diagnosis, but it really depends on you having a very good idea of what normal looks like. Thank you, Dr. Redline. Uh, the next question is, what is the histological finding for maternal floor infarct? So yeah, that's a different lesion. Um, it's um, idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. Um, it's um, fibrin that surrounds the villi and obliterates the intervillous space, usually occupies a, a large percentage of the placenta. It's, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the difference between in, infarcts and perivillous fibrin plaques. So in an infarct, you have decreased perfusion, all the villi kind of collapse onto each other. It's like a macro agglutination. There's necrosis of the trophoblast. Then you have solid nodular lesions in many placentas um, where it's mostly just fibrin that surrounds the villi, but the villi are still separated from one another, and there's no trophoblast necrosis. Maternal floor infarction is a lesion where the entire placenta 
is looks like a perivillous fibrin plaque. It's probably due to trophoblast damage. It can occasionally, it's, it, it overlaps with what I described for COVID, but usually there's not much inflammation. Although it does overlap with a lesion called chronic histiocytic intervillositis, sometimes you can have combination of lesions where you have perivillous fibrin and an increase in monocyte macrophages in the intervillous space. So it's really, it's, it's completely distinct from anything that we talked about today. Um, it's it's, it's um, not well understood, but it, it's very strongly associated with adverse outcomes and it recurs in up to 50% of pregnancies. Thank you again, Dr. Redline. Uh, there is the next question. Some literature talk about the use of CD15 in delays villus maturation. Yeah, that's do an you think, question, yes. <laughs> so do you think uh, delayed villus maturation is a purely morphologic diagnosis and what is your experience with it? So um, I think it's a purely morphologic diagnosis. There's only one group that's been able to use CD15 um, to, to identify areas of delayed villus maturation. So I don't know if they have an unusual clone or they present, they uh, uh, prepare their placentas in an unusual way. It's a, a one group in Germany. This was discussed at the Amsterdam consensus meeting, uh, both of them in Amsterdam and the second one that was in Dublin. Nobody else had been able to get the CD15 antibody to demonstrate this pattern. I, I don't doubt that, that, that it is detecting something that is specific about delayed villus maturation. The pictures are relatively convincing. It may have more to do with high drops or you know, it, it, since, since we none of us really have, a, uh, have had luck in using it. Um, uh, we don't know what it, it's staining. It may or may not be a, a nice tool if we could get it to work, um, you know, where you wouldn't have to subjectively um, uh, make this diagnosis. But thus far, it hasn't been useful for most people. All right. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Redland. There is one more question. When do we actually call it dysmorphic villi, as villi usually do not have specific shape and size? Yeah, so yeah, I, I, as I tried to indicate, some placentas, it's clear cut. You have a lot of inclusions. The villi are very irregular. You might have sprouts. You know, you can be much more confident in those cases. Um, or there's a marked difference between the stem villi and, 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 and the distal villi. Um, I think that you should be confident before you say it. Um, if you're not confident, just let it go or show somebody else or send it uh, for consultation. I don't think this should be overdiagnosed um, because I think it has some meaning and it probably does relate to confined placental mosaicism, which we found out recently in a Nature article is much more common um, than we thought before. And so a lot of these uh, funny looking villi may actually be chromosomally abnormal uh, areas of mosaicism within the placenta that are not in the fetus or in uh, even the majority of the placental tissue. So be careful. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Does sampling fresh placenta different from fixed placenta on, and does it have any effect on identifying maturation defects? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I think that it depends what you're used to. There's no doubt that thick and prefixation makes placentas look a little bit more mature, but you can read through the kind of contraction artifact you get with prefixation. Um, so I, I don't really think it's uh, it, 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 it changes the criteria um, or uh, you know the specificity and sensitivity. But if you're not used to looking at fixed placentas, you may overdiagnose accelerated villus maturation. And if you're not used to looking uh, at fresh placentas, you may overdiagnose delayed villus maturation. That's what I would say at first. Right. Thank you again. And the next question is, can we see chronic histiocytic intervillositis in missed abortions? Yes, absolutely. It's actually more common in first trimester losses than a term. So it was initially described as a cause of recurrent miscarriage. Um, these women can have up to you know, 10, 15 miscarriages or more, but it's a rare condition. This is not a common lesion, but for the women affected, um, you know, it's, it's a desperate you know, diagnosis. So you know, they, they, they'll try experimental therapies, corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and sometimes they work, but there's not enough of them to really have a randomized controlled trial. 
Um, but immunosuppression seems to play a role and sometimes they'll have a successful pregnancy um, after it. So it's actually much less common at term than it is early. So thank you again. Here is another question uh, for maternal villus malformation or fetal villus malformation. How many criteria are needed for diagnosis? Among so, the, so I'm sorry. Just, I will I will complete the question. So among those listed in Amsterdam paper, which ones are the major and which ones are the minor? Right. So um, you mean malperfusion, not malformation? But I have uh, a question. Yeah. Um, that's what our review in modern pathology addresses. Um, it, it's sort of how do we practically implement the Amsterdam classification? What is the minimum you need in order to make that diagnosis? And it, 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 it's a somewhat complicated topic. It differs um, with, with uh, maternal vascular malperfusion. The bottom line is you have to see accelerated villus maturation. You have to see alternating areas of paucity and crowding. You can have all the other things and all the other things are helpful, but without accelerated villus maturation, you shouldn't make the diagnosis. For fetal vascular malperfusion, um, you should either have a lot of avascular villi, or if you only have a few small foci, you should have something else. It should be large vessel lesions like thrombi or uh, stem villus obliteration, um, one of the other venous ectasia, um, and or a clinical history or pathologically abnormal umbilical cord. So it's all spelled out in the review exactly how we how we practice um, in our group. Um, and I think there's sort of general agreement, but it hasn't been written un until until now. Um, there really hasn't been sort of threshold criteria uh, written down. Uh, there's a couple of more questions. So uh, can I complete them, Dr. Redline? Yes. Okay, thank you. So what is the significance of trophoblastic inclusions in tarm placenta without any chromosomal anomalies? Yeah, so the reason that, that this has become an issue is because there's one author, Harvey Kleiman, who said that um, increased trophoblast inclusions are associated with childhood uh, autism, autism spectrum disorder. I think that's a bold um, and not entirely supported claim, and it's a somewhat dangerous claim too. Um, I don't do counts of trophoblast inclusions. Trophoblast inclusions, to me, without other features of dysmorphism, like an irregular contour or disproportion between the proximal and distal villi, um, I wouldn't really even know what to make of it, and I don't make that diagnosis. Right. Uh, there is another question. When do you call accelerated maturation and when do you report distal villus hyperplasia? Yeah, so um, at, if you review the PowerPoint, the, the PDF, um, you'll see that accelerated villus maturation, we need to have alternating areas of paucity and crowding. On high power in the in crowded areas, you should see syncytial knotting, fibrin, and agglutination. In the uh, areas of paucity, you should see long, thin stem villi and a decrease in the number uh, of distal villi. Uh, what was the other? Oh, distal villus hypoplasia. So that's simply a threshold. So once um, you cross the threshold where the areas of paucity occupy most of the placenta, so more than 30% of the placenta shows paucity, then you can call it distal villus hypoplasia. Um, uh, but it's, it's a spectrum. It's just a more severe form of accelerated villus maturation. <laughs> Thank you. So there is, I think, one last question. What is the relationship between the clinical onset of conditions like IUGR slash PE and maturation abnormalities? Yeah, I think that um, preeclampsia has its origins and fetal growth restriction have their origins in the first trimester when you have abnormal vascular remodeling but you don't begin to see, um, usually the, the, the first thing you see is a decrease in placental growth. And then around maybe 24 weeks, you can begin to see the increase in syncytial knots, the, open, the alternating areas, you begin to get the damage with oxidative stress that leads to the knotting and agglutination. And so you feel confident in making the diagnosis. 
But uh, yeah, it, it, the vascular abnormalities, the decidual arteriopathy, um, you can see it as early as like 18 weeks. Um, the um, accelerated villus to maturation, I would say something like 22, 23 weeks. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Redlin. I think we, these are the questions that we had on YouTube and Facebook from our viewers. And thanks really for your time in explaining to our viewers all their questions. And thanks a lot for this excellent talk on this very difficult topic. Uh, and you would be very glad to know that Dr. Redlin, you had several hundred viewers from so many different countries across the world. And I could keep a track of some of those countries that they have mentioned. There were people as far as from Peru, Philippines, Algeria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, then Cambodia, Nepal, Thailand, Malaysia, Egypt, just to name a few. Uh, and Mexico, of course, there were viewers from uh, India, US as well, and some European countries. And thanks to our viewers for your continuous support. And if you like our lectures, so please visit our website that is pathologicast.com where you can access all the lectures so far. And in fact, you would also be able to view the PDF of Dr. Redline's lectures. We will upload it soon. And all the lectures in the website are arranged uh, according to the subspecialities and also according to the speakers. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast, and also follow and like our Facebook page. And we also have a newsletter. So if you subscribe to our newsletter, you can stay connected with all the upcoming lectures. And our next lecture is coming up. That's next month. That's on April 20th. And we will have a GI pathology talk by Dr. Raul Gonzalez from uh, Harvard. So he is going to talk about challenges and gray areas in evaluating and staging colorectal carcinomas. And we hope to see you then. And thank you again, Dr. Redline, for your time and this excellent talk. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye.